morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here this morning. Welcome to those who are visiting with us, and welcome to all those joining us online. We're glad to have you with us this morning as well. And you may be seated as we have our gathering chorus.
You may be seated and we invite the children forward. Good morning. How's everyone today? Now, if I said to you that school had ended and you had two months off before Christmas, and I asked if that was great, what would you say? Absolutely not. Great. Nice. nice. <laughs> I, I heard a parent say, absolutely not. I heard some teachers say that would be great too. <laughs> Sweetie, can you open the Gospel Treasures box and pull up the book inside? All right, let's see what we've got too many. Grab that. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Watch your fingers. Now, today we have Have You Filled a Bucket Today? Hmm. Wow, that sounds interesting. Let's see what it says. All day long, everyone in the whole wide world walks around carrying an invisible bucket. You can't see it, but it's there. You have a bucket. Each member of your family has a bucket. Your grandparents, friends, and neighbors all have a bucket. Everyone carries an invisible bucket. Your bucket has one purpose only. Its purpose is to hold your good thoughts and your good feelings about yourself. You feel very happy and good when your bucket is full. And you feel very sad and lonely when your bucket is empty. Other people feel the same way too. They're happy when their buckets are full, and they're sad when their buckets are empty. It's great to have a full bucket, and this is how it works. You need other people to fill your bucket. And other people need to fill theirs. So, how do we fill a bucket? You fill a bucket when you show love to someone, when you say or do something kind, or even when you give someone a smile. That's being a bucket filler. A bucket filler is a loving, caring person who says or does nice things that make others feel special. When you make someone feel special, you are filling a bucket. But you can also dip into a bucket and take out some good feelings. You dip into a bucket when you make fun of someone, when you say or do mean things, or when you ignore someone. That's being a bucket dipper. A bully is a bucket dipper. A bucket dipper says or does mean things that make others feel bad. Many people who dip have an empty bucket. They think they can fill their own bucket by dipping into someone else's, but that will never work. You never fill your own bucket when you dip into someone else's. But guess what? When you fill someone's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. You feel good when you help others feel good. All day long, we are either filling up or dipping into each other's buckets by what we say and what we do. Try to fill a bucket and see what happens. <coughs> you love your mom and dad. Why not tell them you love them? You can even tell them why. Your caring words will fill their buckets right up. Watch for smiles to light up their faces. You will feel like smiling too. A smile is a good clue that you have filled a bucket. If you practice, you'll become a great bucket filler. Just remember that everyone carries an invisible bucket and think of what you can say or do to fill it. Here are some ideas for you. You could smile and say hi to the bus driver. He has a bucket too. You could invite the new kid at school to play with you. You could, you could write a thank you note to your teacher. You could tell your grandpa that you'd like to spend time with him. There are many ways to fill a bucket. Bucket filling is fun and easy to do. It doesn't matter how young or old you are. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't take much time. And remember, when you fill someone else's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. 
If you're a bucket filler, you make your home, your school, and your neighborhood better places to be. Bucket filling makes everyone feel good. So why not decide to be a bucket filler today and every day? Just start each day by saying to yourself, I'm going to do something to fill someone's bucket today. And at the end of each day, ask yourself, did I fill a bucket today? Yes, I did. That's the life of a bucket filler. And that's you. That is a very cool story. And I have to tell you, someone filled my bucket this week. You see, I was in Sherwood Cemetery as part of a Remembrance Day event with hundreds of school children. And there was one particular um, boy who came up to me and filled my bucket. You know what he did? He gave me a big hug. He put his arm around me, and I was speaking to all those children, and suddenly I didn't feel nervous anymore because Caleb had filled my bucket. And that felt very special. Thank you, Caleb, for filling my bucket on Monday of this week in Sherwood Cemetery. And that's just one way that we can all fill the buckets of others. And I wonder, you know what? There's some adults here, and there's some children here, and we all have invisible buckets. So I'm thinking, after church, maybe there's a way that we can fill the buckets of others. Maybe by saying hi to them, or telling them that we're glad they're in church, or even putting our arm around them and giving them a little hug like Caleb did for me. There's all kinds of ways that we can fill the buckets of people in our families, in our church, and at school, and in our, in our community. So, if you'll close your eyes and hold your hands, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. And thank you for giving me a bucket. Help me to fill it and to fill the buckets of those around me. Please bless me and keep me safe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Great. God, over and over again, you turn our understanding of the world upside down. You say, blessed are the poor in spirit, but we tend to seek to increase our wealth and make ourselves more comfortable. You say, blessed are the merciful, while the world around us encourages us to seek revenge when we are wronged. You say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but we hunger after things. We thirst for social status, for power and influence. You say, blessed are the peacemakers, but we are so often more concerned with getting our own way than living peaceably with each other. Lord God, we confess before you this morning that in so many ways we do the complete opposite of what you want us to do. And so we ask you to forgive us. Forgive us for all ways we focus on ourselves and forget about you and each other. Teach us once again, gracious God, what it means to walk in your way and delight in your will. Help us to truly hunger for righteousness, to surrender our pride, and to give you control over the decisions of our lives. Teach us, Lord, what it means to be merciful, what it means to be pure in heart with our words and our actions, and even our thoughts. Lord God, teach us what it means to be peacemakers and to live for you in this world. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news of God's forgiveness. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. 
Through our faith in Jesus Christ and through our confession of our sins, we have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. And I invite you now to turn in your pew Bibles to page 548 as we have a responsive psalm for this morning from Psalm 91. And we invite Kathy to lead us. Would you like some good news? Would you like to hear something that will lift your spirit and maybe even make you laugh? <laughs> if so, <laughs> you've come to the right place. The following are actual letters written to ministers from children. Dear Pastor, I know God loves everybody, but he never met my sister. <laughs> Yours sincerely, Arnold, age eight. 
Dear Pastor, my mother is very religious. She goes to play bingo at church every week, <laughs> even if she has a cold. Yours truly, Annette, age nine. Dear Pastor, I think more people would come to your church if you moved it to Disneyland. <laughs> Lorraine, age nine. Dear Pastor, my father says I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't think I want to because we have enough rules in our house already. <laughs> Joshua, age 10. I hope those letters made you smile. Because the good news is, God made you for laughter and for joy. Which reminds me, there was a minister who was an avid golfer. Every chance he could get, he could be found on the golf course to the point that it became a virtual obsession. One Sunday was a picture-perfect day for golfing. And the sun was shining, there were no clouds in the sky, the temperature was absolutely perfect. The minister, overcome with temptation, called an assistant, told him he was sick, and asked the assistant to take care of the Sunday service. Then he drove three hours to a golf course where no one would recognize him. And happily, he set out to play the course. An angel up above was watching the minister and quite perturbed. He went to God and said, Look at that minister. He should be punished for what he's doing. God nodded in agreement. The minister teed up on the first hole. He swung at the ball and hit a perfect drive straight as an arrow. 400 yards to the green where it gently rolled and dropped into the cup. A perfect hole in one. The minister cheered in excitement. The angel, on the other hand, was a little shocked. He turned to God and said, <clears throat> begging your pardon, but I thought you were going to punish him. God smiled and said, I did. But he just got a hole in one, the angel protested. Yes, God agreed, but who's he going to tell? <laughs> now here's a trivia question for you. Who said, if you're not allowed to laugh in heaven, I don't want to go there? It wasn't a comedian. In fact, it was none other than church leader and Protestant reformer Martin Luther. You may find that hard to believe because we tend to have an image of reformers as pretty stuffy and uptight. But do you know what else Martin Luther said? He said, you should have as much laughter as you have faith. With this in mind, it's good to remind ourselves that the first item in the, Pres in the Presbyterian Catechism asks this question. <laughs> what is the chief purpose of humankind? And the answer is to know God and to enjoy Him forever. Please turn with me in your pew Bibles to our New Testament scripture lesson as we ask ourselves, how do we do that? How can we experience the good news of knowing God and enjoying Him forever? And if you'll turn in your uh, blue pew Bibles to page 61 in your New Testament section, we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 16. Page 61, Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 16. When he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture 
has been fulfilled in your hearing. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is Jesus' first recorded sermon. And notice that he quotes directly from Isaiah chapter, 20, chapter 61 that describes the purpose of the Messiah. And in verse 18, Jesus says that his purpose is to bring good news. Right at the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus wants everyone to know that what he is about is good news. And this makes such perfect sense because of what was said about Jesus just before he was born. Something that's probably very, very familiar to all of us. So if you'll please turn back a few pages to Luke chapter 2, which you will find on page 68. Luke chapter 2, I want to be, read a few verses beginning at verse 8. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 8. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. On the night of Jesus' birth, the angels declared to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy. Knowing God and enjoying Him forever, as the Presbyterian Catechism declares, is summarized in a single word. It's Jesus. You see, for Christians, the good news is not a what, it's rather a who. The good news for us as Christians is all connected to the person of Jesus Christ and the gifts that He has for each one of us. Those gifts like forgiveness of our sins, and salvation, and eternal life. And the other thing that makes these gifts so special is that they are ongoing. As I like to remember all those who take new members classes, if you remember nothing more, please remember this. Christianity is not a religion, it is a relationship. And relationships are ongoing. Relationships are dynamic, which means that as your relationship with Jesus deepens, so too does your faith and your peace and your love and your confidence and your holiness and your joy. Is this good news something that you need? In fact, right now, how much good news is part of your life? When you wake up in the morning, is good news and great joy part of your first thoughts? For many of us, we wake up and we begin the instant mental checklist of what needs to get done that day, complete with how long it will take, what will be involved to get into each place we need to be, and then we think of the multiple scenarios that could go wrong and how we will deal with these things if they go wrong, and the stress over that mental checklist escalates and grows even more if we're interrupted by someone texting us and calling us and we've got to try to fit that into the list. For many of us, when we wake up first thing in the morning, there's very little good news or joy. There's just a lot of pressure and stress. God wants you to start your day with a completely different attitude. God wants you to wake up each morning in your first thought to be those of good news and great joy. Now, we may not think those actual words but God wants you to wake up each morning thinking, I have good things, joyful things in my life, and good things that are going to happen to me today. 
God wants us to anticipate and expect good things as you go throughout your day. God wants that to be your attitude as you begin the day. And to experience those good things in our lives, there's something else we need to do. Advent begins in a couple of weeks. And as you know, we will read the Christmas story, including those familiar words spoken to the shepherds on the hillside outside of Bethlehem. Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy. And here's the thing. The shepherds, when they heard those words of good news and great joy, well, they could have rejected it. They could have ignored it. Instead, on their iPads, work with me, they could have been so focused on reading the bad news headlines that they wouldn't have even had time to hear the angels. But instead, they realized that if they were going to benefit from the good news of the angels' words, they had to receive it, they had to believe it, and they had to choose to focus on it. We have a similar opportunity. Starting tomorrow morning, when you wake up, push that mental checklist aside, and first of all, pray. Speak to the one who is good news and tell Jesus that in his strength you will look for the positives in your day and that you will choose to receive and to share good news of joy with those around you. We have all been given good news, the best news, and it's up to us to live it and to share it. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. And let's sing together the joy of the Lord is my strength. as well. So there's the third win. 
But uh, the final day for orders before Christmas is Sunday, December 10th. And is it today an order's going in? So an order's going in today and then every other week until December 10th. So. And the order forms are on back of, of that sheet that you were given today. Just a reminder that we're having a Christmas bake sale here at the church on Saturday, November 25th from 9 a.m. until the items are sold. Um, so donations of baked goods like biscuits, bread, cookies, squares, pies, fudge, candy, uh, preserves will be gratefully received and can be brought to the church either Friday, November 24th from 3 to 4 p.m. or before 8.30 or by 8.30, I guess I should say, on the Saturday morning. So uh, we'll gratefully receive any donations for the bake sale. And the next night is our annual Christmas concert with Kendall Doherty and friends. And I was talking to Jason on Friday and he said it's the only Christmas concert scheduled so far. So uh, buy your tickets early because it will probably sell out where it's the only one. Tickets are 15 per person and Lois has them. And I'll also have some at the church office. And also, as usual, we will be selling fudge and water at the concert, so if you're able to make some extra fudge that weekend for the bake sale and bring it in for the uh, Kendall Doherty concert, if you could speak to Lauren and McCory, that would be greatly appreciated. Then right. as we prepare for prayer, the choir is going to sing, sing this joyful morning.
Loving God, help us to focus on the good news that is ours through our faith in Jesus Christ so that we will not become discouraged and help us to share that good news with others. Lord God, as we look toward Advent, we look forward with hope. <clears throat> hope that Christmas will bring a measure of peace and joy to our world as we once again celebrate that good news of great joy. Lord God, as we pray together this day, we pray for all those who are in need of tender, loving care, whether their needs are physical, emotional, or spiritual. We pray for each one and pray especially this day for Jeff Sanderson, for Dot Painter, for Alvina Wood, and for all those who need to sense and feel your presence and your healing hand. Lord God, we pray for peace in our world. We pray for a peaceful end to all conflicts. And we pray that those in leadership will look for ways to achieve peace and that people will set aside selfish ambition so that we will work together and live in unity. Lord God, we pray that as we begin this new week that each one of us will take Tom's words to heart and that as we waken each day, we will think of the good news, of the good things that you have in store for us, and we will focus on and look for the goodness in our lives. Help us to do that, Lord, and to share the good news with others. And we ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And our closing hymn this morning is Joyful, Joyful.
fellowship time in the hall right after the service, and as we're standing together, let's sing our benediction. <laughs> 